We'll be getting to our guests here in just a moment, but I do want to just run through a few reminders and announcements. Uh, this next Practices Weekly series, for those not familiar, is every Thursday at the same time at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. You see there on the right some of the upcoming calls that we'll have with outstanding guests from Outreach, Spirit Airlines, Virgin Pulse, and covering a wide range of topics from strategic HR, hybrid work, talent and learning, and more. A couple of other things to let you know about. Uh, in addition to being a human capital research firm, we also have an executive search practice. Uh, obviously, a company like I4CP, we've got a broad network and broad set of capabilities uh, in the human capital space, and we know a lot of people. Uh, and uh, if you're looking for uh, your next executive within HR in any of the areas you see listed here, we'd be happy to help uh, with that. Um, Kevin, anything you'd, you'd like to add there? I know you're personally involved in, in some of this work yourself. I think you said it well, Tom. Uh, you know, certainly uh, it's been fun uh, finding high performing talent for high performing organizations. Uh, so happy to try to help anybody who has openings on their HR leadership team. And this is a, a practice that we have not just for I4CP member organizations, but we're certainly open to helping any company that, that has a need like that. So just reach out if you want to learn more. Uh, you see the URL there at the bottom, and, and Zeta is putting that in the chat. Also want to note, again, our most recent large study, Culture Fitness, the Healthy Habits of High Performance Organizations. Uh, we'll put the link in that to the chat as well. Um, this was the second major study that we've done on culture following on our culture renovation work from a few years ago. And this one really focused on the difference between healthy organizations and those that have pockets of toxicity in their culture. Uh, and what are some of the differences? What, some, what are some of the traits of healthy organizations versus those that are toxic? Um, I'd like to call out uh, a session that we did here on Next Practices Weekly on February 16th, where Kevin and Catherine Brecken a uh, colleague on the, on the research team walked through some of the key findings from that study. Uh, so if you missed that session, that uh, all of these sessions are recorded. You can go back and, and watch that in the archives. Kevin, I know you've been giving a lot of talks on this study uh, along with Catherine often. Um, anything more you want to add here? I think the, uh, the elevator pitch here is that if you're trying to improve productivity in the organization, uh, stop focusing on return to the office and start focusing on how do we improve the the health of the culture. That's the uh, tried and true and data proven way to improve overall productivity and uh, the market performance of the organization. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so focus on on the culture, not so much the wear of the work. Love that. And the last thing I want to mention, I, I alluded earlier to our recent Next Practices Now conference. Um, we've already announced the dates for next year's conference, March 25th through the 28th. Once again, the Fairmont Princess in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, so if you haven't been to that conference in the past, uh, or if you are a returning uh, attendee, we'd love to see you there. Folks are already registering. We often get a lot of registrations uh, for the next year's conference at the current year's conference, uh, and that's already happened. So uh, learn more about that uh, if you're already making travel plans for next March. All right, with that, let's dive into the conversation with our special guests today, and I'm going to turn things over to you, Kevin, to facilitate that. Great. Thanks, Tom. And I'm thrilled to have uh, Rob and Karen with us today, um, probably two guests that don't need a whole lot of introduction. Um, those of you who are have been coming to our events and uh, are familiar with I4CP will certainly know Rob. Rob is a professor at Babson. Uh, he's written uh, several books, including the one we're going to talk about today, along with his co-author, uh, Karen Dillon. Karen uh, is the former editor at Harvard Business Review Magazine. She's the co-author of three books with Clayton Christensen. Um, and uh, is is uh, contributed greatly to the micro stress effect. So Rob and Karen, welcome. Thank you so much for having us here. We appreciate it. Um, why don't I, I'm, this is gonna be uh, one of those calls where we just kind of turn things over to you guys and you uh, tell us a lot about um, what you found in your research and what you found in the book itself. So I think we should just start out, first of all, uh, saying that the book is now out. I know we've been talking about it for a few months, but the book uh, was published just a couple of days ago officially, and you can buy the book. Um, but I'd love to just hear, Rob, you tell us a little bit about what microstress is and uh, sure. tell, tell the audience you know, what goes into microstress. 
Yeah, absolutely. And just to put a little story behind it, people, uh, you know, asked me what what kind of got us started on the research. And to be honest, we weren't looking for this. <laughs> we were really going down a path of looking at what are the ways that relationships have a positive impact on our well-being, uh, because there's such a body of work out showing that connectivity and the, the quality of our connections are falling off. And there's a really significant health, you know, related issue and, and mental well-being related issue with that. And so I was in, you know, literally the first interview of ultimately it was 600 across two studies we did uh, around this work that uh, I was gearing in and just saying, you know, tell me a lovely life science executive, tell me about a time in your life you were becoming more physically healthy. And she kind of chuckled and said, I did everything I could to dodge anything physically health related in high school and early 20s and uh, made it, you know, to late 30s doing okay on that. And then suddenly things caught up to me. And my doctor said, uh, you need to, to do something about it. And so her solution was she started walking around a, a park out Cider flat in London and started to bump into people and they started walking longer and further and that went into a charity walk and charity runs and so as I you know was talking to her 10 years later she was then describing to me that she had become somebody where running was a core component of her identity and she was actually planning vacations with her spouse where they would run a marathon before you know going on vacation and so the transformation was unbelievable right? Somebody that had been sedentary workaholic and had kind of built this into her life. And yet what she was saying was the running was a part of her identity that helped her push back on work. But um, what really mattered was the authenticity of the connections in the group she was a part of. She wasn't spending just time with life sciences executives and other things like that. It was the male person, an IT executive, a neurosurgeon, and they saw life differently. Uh, the, the, they saw her at her worst. She saw them at their worst. And that really created a, a component of dimensionality in her life that we'll come back to a couple of times, I'm sure, as we talk today. Um, but, but what really got our attention on this is I stopped at about 45 minutes in and I said, well, how did you get stuck to begin with? You know, somebody as smart as you are, as thoughtful as you are, you know, living life on, on other ways. How did you get trapped? And she couldn't answer for a while. You know, it's just this dead silence for 30, 60 seconds. And she finally said, I don't know. You know, and that led into looking at the next 45 minutes of that interview, diving into what I don't know, man, and where these kind of small moments of stress came from. And we persisted that throughout uh, the interviews. And really what we found is that um, the big stressors are still there, right? And we still have disassociated stress, like the war in the Ukraine, the economy, social justice issues. But one thing that was under-recognized that was killing people was these small moments of stress that come at us where we sense misalignment with a colleague, you know, and, and we know we got to get over that, but it's in the back of our head. And then you immediately see a team member that needs to be coached. And you're thinking, how am I going to do that and preserve their engagement? And you get a text from a child 10 seconds later, and uh, you can't tell if it's a big issue or, or something that uh, they're over in two seconds and, and you worry about for three hours. And, and it's really all those small moments that we call micro stress, right? These things kind of exist beneath our awareness. They don't trigger the fight or flight response, um, but our bodies absorb it, right? And the volume, velocity, and pace of them today, uh, because of how hyper-connected we are, has, has kind of gone through the roof. And that's really what we got honed in on, right? It was these small moments that are almost invisible to us. None of them in isolation are huge deals, but in aggregate, it's having a deadening effect on burnout, innovation, all sorts of other health-related issues for people today. You know, one, one stat I was fascinated by, uh, both Rob and Karen, was the fact that today people feel more stress than, than they did at the beginning of the pandemic, which previously was the um, uh, highest uh, recorded point of stress uh, that we've seen in society. Um, you know, I'd be curious to, to hear from you and to Karen, maybe you can tackle this, you know, why is that? And then let, let's look at, you know, just some of those examples of micro stress that Rob was talking about. Sure. I'm just going to add a, a asterisk to explain that I literally just had a micro stress at the start of this. My daughter from college called on my phone and I thought my phone was silent and I see her calling and then I'm you saw me disappear for a minute. I'm worried what's going on is she never calls me. So that, I mean, literally real time micro stress happened here. So, um, so, so post pandemic, yes, you would, we all would think the pandemic was the most stressful thing that we could go through, but the pandemic did some things that were, uh, that made it worse, make, make, made micro stress worse, even coming out of it. Um, so for many of us, for example, you know, we hunkered down at home, we needed to, and we introduced the reality of doing this all day, being on Zoom calls all day and being connected to people all day. And though we had done it before, I think it became really the way we worked for a long time. 
And with good intentions, for example, managers might have said, we won't do any hour meetings. That's too much. Let's just cut back to half hour meetings. And then suddenly, instead of having seven or eight one hour meetings in the day where we have follow ups and to do's and opportunities to misalign with colleagues, we have 16 of them. You know, we have, we have 16 half hour meetings. So we've sort of created more touch points that don't that give us the opportunity to create micro stress for one another. And at the same time, what happened during the pandemic is it sort of took us out of the habits we had of being connected with other people in really positive ways. So we got sort of you know, spit out of the pandemic, ready for this now super hyper connected world and had a lot fewer of the things that help with micro stress that are baked into our everyday lives. So um, it's, it's worse than ever, I, in my opinion. <laughs> I love that phrase, spit out of the pandemic. That's the way I think a lot of <laughs> In the shoot, in the fast shoot. Um, and, I, I, and we can just talk about, Rob, you might want to talk about this. Like, what, how does micro stress affect you in a typical day? It's just the whole point of micro stress is that we don't have language uh, to talk about it. We don't recognize it's happening. These all seem like very small things. And individually, they are. But, but cumulatively, they really take a toll. So this, Rob, just walked through how um, a day in the life might be uh, yeah. adding micro stress to your pile. Yeah, yeah, and what we what we found is that there were fourteen of these micro stresses as we went through you know hundreds of interviews, right? And we're really categorizing and seeing what are the common ones. Uh, a series of them that had to do with things that drained our personal capacity. So the first dial here, uh, you know, and that could be things like dealing with changing direction from a boss, understanding a curt or abrupt tone on email, and, and over interpreting that, jumping between thirty minute meetings two hours on email that's ballooned as you've been through all these meetings and you're trying to get caught up. Uh, just common things that everybody, you know, as you look down this list, you would say that those are all happening to me today, right? <laughs> Not just, the, you know, yesterday or this week. Uh, another category of them that had to do with things that just burned us out emotionally, right? That hit us kind of in, a, in an emotional sense. And for sure, there would be things like conflictual conversations or things that we conventionally think about with stress. But what was really interesting to us too is that some of the most impactful impactful micro stresses actually would come at people from others they cared about deeply, right? And so it could be, you know, family members, friends that are going through a hard time, aging parents that you're taking care of, taking care and worrying about your team, right? If you can get them the developmental opportunities they need, or you're pushed to treat people in a way that you don't feel good about because of the pressures coming down on you. Um, and so that was one of the, the, the things that was really different about this when Karen talked about putting a lens around micro stresses and putting a term on it. Um, the fact that these stresses are coming at us through connections in our lives uh, really actually magnifies them in an interesting way. You know, if I'm getting stressed or some form of stress put on me by somebody I don't like, I'm flaring up even more, right, because of that. And if it's somebody I care about or, God forbid, somebody I love, I'm really flaring up you know, in different ways, right? It hits you, you know, in a more magnified way than disassociated stress that's that's going on. Uh, and so, you know, things that hit us emotionally, you know, were part of this package. And then the last was things that just kind of challenged our identity, right? And slowly moved us uh, from being the person that we set out to be. And this can be, um, you know, getting messages around pursuing highly aggressive sales goals, if you look at what physicians are struggling with today is that they're not able to deliver care in the way that they set out to most of them as they started, you know, their professions, um, all sorts of subtle cues that start to create conditions where you're drifting from the person you set out to be. And that, to me, was probably the most troubling. You go through, you know, hundreds and hundreds of interviews like this where you're 90 minutes and you're deep in people's kitchen <laughs> by the end of it in conversations that we probably only have with four or five people in our lives. And I would say something like 92, 94% of them had stretches in their lives where they went three, five, eight years and just suddenly woke up one day and said, what have I been doing, right? I, I've just mm -hmm. kind of fallen into this pattern of uh, others' expectations around me and I've become somebody that I didn't really mean to be uh, at the end of the day. And those tended to be not big things, you know, again, not major health crises or, you know, big disruptions in life. It tended to be the slow accumulation of uh, micro stresses that, that challenged identity in different ways. Um, and so this is a, a day in the life, right? And most people would look at this and say, all these have happened today, maybe, you know, or they happened yesterday. <laughs> um, and none of them are insurmountable, right? But it's this accumulation that slowly starts to kind of put a lot of pressure on us in ways that we have not been thinking about or, or dealing with uh, as much until recently. And so what does this do to our well-being uh, overall? We've talked a lot about uh, mental and emotional well-being as part of the pandemic. I'd just be curious, you know, how does this affect the, the human brain overall? 
Well, the reality is our body actually doesn't distinguish between different forms of stress. It may come in smaller increments, but our body is still responding to the stress that we have. But what happens with micro stress is because they're so quick and so brief and they're, again, we, they happen in, in moments in the normal course of our day, they're baked into our days. Our frontal lobe, which is the mental scratch pad where we kind of start to remember things, um, it, it, it shrinks under stress generally, and it comes so quickly that it may not imprint on our frontal lobe in the same way. So we may not remember why we're feeling the way we're feeling, but our body does. Our body is starting to recognize it. And we have all of the normal sort of stress reactions with micro stress that you would have with the more macro stress without the fight or flight mechanisms that protect us necessarily kicking in. And we know from lots of research, you get higher blood pressure, heart rate, hormonal and metabolic changes. There's even some interesting research that suggests that uh, if you were exposed to social stress within two hours of a meal, your body may metabolize that meal as if you ate 104 more calories than you really did. And if that happened every day, that would add 11 pounds in a year. Um, the body can metabolize what are known as good fats as if they were bad fats when you're under stress. There's just a lot that happens to us physically, but the key thing is here, you don't really know what's happening because these things are almost not mentioned, they're not, almost not registering in your brain. So it's, it's over time, it can take an enormous toll. One of the neurologists we talked to talked about it as a difference between a big explosion, a dynamite explosion in a mountain, a major stress where you see the whole, you know what happened, it's, it's obvious, it's evident. Um, but micro stress is like wind eroding that, that mountain over time. It's still gonna bring it down to a nub over time, um, but you may not know why and when it happened. So I think that last bullet point about uh, the, the meal and adding ca calories overall, a lot of people probably nodded their head and said, okay, that's that's what's going on. <laughs> exactly. so, it's somebody else's fault. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so does that mean we should be uh, eating our meals in solitary confinement, Karen, and uh, just <laughs> you, waiting? You should be eating your meals with people that you enjoy being with. That's the thing. Solitary <laughs> actually may be better that you, you try to avoid eating it after you've been stressed socially. So whatever doesn't stress you socially is probably a better way to go. Yeah, got it. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about some of the common micro stressors then. You know, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people can relate to, you know, what you're talking about, but, you know, let's talk about what, what are some of the ones that maybe fly under the radar uh, for a lot of folks? Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll grab that and also describe this table a little bit, you know, diagnostically. These are uh, grids that we put up on our sites and other tools that people have access to through all of this. Um, but if we just go through the categories I mentioned about drains to personal capacity, um, misalignment of roles and priorities, that's become huge as we've gone to these more agile ways of working, more cross-functional team-based work. Most people are not just on one team, but typically five, six, sometimes seven uh, efforts that they're, you know, allocated across. And so you get a lot of situations where people agree in a room and go off and pull in slightly different directions, right? That starts to create stress. Most people's uh, nightmare career scenarios were generally tied back to not dealing with misalignment early and directly, you know, as an example. Uh, but to your point, you know, a more subtle one might be this when others don't deliver reliably. And so what we're seeing is um, because people are distributed across so many different collaborative efforts today, leaders just you know, they don't have the analytics to see the footprint of what they're driving by throwing teams at everything at the heart of it. And they, that's just become a knee jerk reaction, a team, a committee, whatever it may be, is, is a, a way to kind of get things done. And the problem is, if you're on four or five of these efforts and you happen to own one where, you know, let's say there's four other people on yours and they come back 95 percent done right, for what you needed. They're almost complete, you know, just missing by 5%, not a big deal um, in their minds anyway. And everybody had a great reason for it, right? The, they didn't understand their child got sick or, or called with a text, whatever it may be. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, one person just always flakes out on you. The problem is with how interdependent things are today, those 5% misses across four people means 20% to you. Right. And most people are then stuck with this choice of do I say something about it, which feels kind of weird, it's 5%, or do I work harder and just kind of cover people's misses? And most people choose to do that, right? To work harder, cover the misses. And the problem then a lot of times is then you've conveyed to people that, okay, 95% was good enough here, maybe 90% the next time. And not, I'm, I'm really convinced on this, not because people are nefarious. 
But because as we went through this, it was incredibly clear by the time we got down into, you know, minute 45, minute 60 of these interviews, that most people are making decisions not on how to excel today, but on which balls they can let drop, you know, at work or at home and, and kind of how to try to get through, given how uh, overwhelmed everybody is. Um, so that's that's a couple in the, the drain uh, capacity. I don't care. Do you want to pick up one on the emotional reserve and and uh, and kind of describe one there and then I can come back and, and tell a little sure. bit. Sure. Sure. So um, the one I actually I relate to most personally because I was a longtime manager is the first one on this list here, managing and feeling responsible for the success or well-being of others. We often think as managers, you often think of all the things that stress you about everybody that you're working with, the things they do wrong, the, the things you have to do. But I, I think the, the converse is equally applicable here is when you actually care so much about the people that work for you that you're that you you feel responsible for them and you want them to succeed and you may be seeing them struggling and trying to figure out how do I coach them again, you may be worried, have you advocated for them enough for raises with the higher ups to the people outside of your, your department, see them properly? Are they struggling at home? We had some really great stories of people uh, losing their visual cues when, over the pandemic when they were just able to see people on Zoom and they didn't really know how they were doing. Um, and so I think that's a really good example of, you know, if you think of the opposite things, you know, it's so hard being manager, it is, but, but for surprising reasons. Um, and then one of the ones that I like personally as well is that who hasn't left the house early in the morning um, with exchanging curt words with your spouse or with your kids, you just, you know, you're getting out of the house and everyone's grumpy and it's all over some inconsequential chore. But for most of us, that sort of sticks with you all day. You're just feeling a little bit bad about yourself and uh, you're, you just somehow um, have had a little conversation that sort of set you up in the wrong, in the wrong way. Um, and then, the, oh, sorry, I always love the third one too, because it's, it's true for so many of us too. I think a lot of us have worked with people who are constantly stressed, you know, the chicken littles of the world, the, the, the people who, for whom everything's always terrible and it's going bad and they're pulling you into their office to talk about something and they're kind of stirring up, you know, spraying stress all over the place you know, we pick up stress from other people. We call it secondhand stress in the book, but that's a real thing for us. There's, there's even some really interesting research about mirror neurons, basically, that shows the expression, I feel your pain, is quite literally real. So when you are in a room with someone, this research suggests um, that you're close to, that you care about, who is experiencing pain, your brain will process that as if you are experiencing pain too. So those are all things that come from really people you care about, not from jerks in your life, that somehow that interaction has ended up causing you some micro stress that's going to stick with you all day. It's interesting there. I started watching this show on uh, Netflix called Beef, and uh, the entire show is based on a road rage incident that happens like in the first minute of the show. So a little micro stress of, uh, event and then just sets off a, you know, a cate mm -hmm. catechism mm -hmm. of, you know, different events <laughs> that happen. And I think a lot of us probably feel that way sometimes in our days, right, where, you know, some some of the smallest micro stress events that we might not even think about has just altered our, our path for that day or for that week. Oh, right, Kevin, right. having watched that episode too, I'm going to add where the second micro stress came in after the road rage incident. The woman who has the road rage incident wants to talk about it with her husband later in the day, and he ignores her. He doesn't. He tries to soothe her, but he doesn't let her talk about it, and that's a micro stress, right? You've now had an interaction with your significant other that has not been helpful to you, hasn't let you vent, hasn't done the right thing, and that's second. It just makes things worse. Basically, you can see it makes things worse. Right. Right. Yeah, you could see in this work, there was a lot of cascading, like small moments like that, that started and it led to another form of, of stress, you know, in different ways. Um, I'll, I'll grab the last category here on challenges to identity and, uh, you know, some that we've already mentioned, right, excessive pressures in different ways, you, you know, that, that we've all experienced. One that's a little more subtle is this disruptions to your network. And what we could see um, is that a lot of our identity of who we, we view, you know, of ourselves as being is built up by the product of the people we're spending time with, you know, around us, both professionally and personally in different ways. And so what we would see a lot of is many, many times people would go through a transition in their lives and maybe a move to a different city to take a, a, another job that looked better, you know, in many fronts and maybe a promotion up um, or some other world of work that's going to come down on them. And I would say about 90% of the people would just resolve themselves that the next 12 months is going to stink. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to kind of hunker down. They didn't go home, tell their family this. It's just, you don't see, you're not going to see me around here, you know, much anymore. And with the idea that, you know what, I'm going to get back into my tennis group later on, my church group and this group of friends that I've been spending time with, right? And what would happen is they never did. 
like 90% of the time, they would go into this transition, they would become a smaller version of themselves. And those activities or those friendships had kind of passed by, and they didn't kind of get back into them. And it had a, an effect on who they were as, as individuals, right? Uh, in contrast, what was really interesting to me is what we call our 10 percenters, one of the hallmarks of them, the really people that were really crushing the performance and the thriving metrics at the same time, they would tend to go into a transition and say, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna go into this and become a larger version of myself, right? Versus the people that would go in and say, I'm gonna hunker down. Those people, if you did that three, five, six times through your life, you just become a more narrow version of yourself over time. And a lot of times those stories didn't end well when everything was either your profession and your, your direct family only, right? You didn't have other things that were kind of creating dimensionality there. So, you know, what I would uh, say, and I saw a really neat text come through that one I saw is maybe we should have self in this, in this column here. And I, I totally agree, right? People are going <laughs> to drive this on themselves. What Karen and I were looking for really were the relational forms of this. And if you're if you have this grid or you can pull it off our 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 site, you know, as well, there's kind of three things you want to do with it. You know, one is take a pass through it and just say, where are two or three of these stresses hitting me systemically enough that I should do something about it? Right. I should shift the interaction. I should create space between those interactions. Maybe I have to have that interaction with other people to keep it from being less uh, difficult for me, but just two or three that are systemic enough that you should be shaping them. Most of you will say I could fill 10 or 15 squares out here and don't do that, right? Because if it's everything, it's nothing, right? But get down to two or three and you'll find that actually thinking about how to shape the negative interaction has a surprisingly powerful impact on our well-being. What we know in general is that the negative interactions have about three to five times the impact of the positive in our lives. And so if we're not doing things that shape the negatives, right, if we're just doing, say, meditation, mindfulness, gratitude, all that's really valuable stuff today, without a doubt. But if you're not doing things that also shape the negative, you're actually leaving really high leverage stuff on the table. Uh, and so that's the first thing we push people on. Second is to go through then and say, where am I unnecessarily causing it? And that's, you know, because we don't want this to spread culturally or in other ways, like uh, we were talking about earlier. But what we also saw in all the interviews is that the stress that we unnecessarily cause almost inevitably boomerangs back on us in a different form, right? So you lean too heavily on an employee and they start to, um, you know, back away, right? They're disengaged, they're exhausted, and you end up picking up more work, especially if they leave or you push a child too hard on a certain trajectory that in the scope of things really doesn't matter, but you're just kind of down in the weeds and it comes back in a, uh, a different form. Um, and so you want to think about that, right? Where are you unnecessarily causing it? What can you do? And then the third is where are you magnifying it too much, right? Where are two or three of these points where you've just gotten down into the weeds and, you know, you really need to take a step back and say in the perspective or the context of life uh, overall, this just isn't that big a deal. Right. And that was really the magic of the 10 percenters by virtue of the dimensionality they kept in their lives. Um, they tended to see those stresses for what they were, right? The people that got down into very unidimensional lives with just the professional, uh, they tended to be the ones that, that everything got magnified uh, in, in significant ways. Hey, Rob, I, I'm, I'm glad you called out uh, Christy's comment in the chat that maybe another column here needs to be self. I think that... Uh, definitely would apply for, for a fair number of these where we cause the, the stress mostly ourselves and don't need to do that. Um, the, one of the ones that we uh, didn't hit on with a little more depth here uh, in that middle category uh, is mistrust in your network. Mm -hmm. I'd love for either of you or both to to comment on that one. And, and I, I, I call it out because it's something that we're starting to hear more and more various uh, sessions with our member organizations that they're concerned that throughout this year and into next year, trust is going to be an increasing issue um, for mm -hmm. organizations in various ways. And, and it's just an interesting one to see here as, as a, a source of micro stress. Yeah. So I'll, I'll jump on and then Karen, you, you, you know, jump in too. Um, the, um, uh, what we mean by that, it's not that you distrust someone. I really want to kind of call that out because we've, in the in the Connected Commons, we've done work for over a decade now where we've actually mapped dimensions of trust, right? People think of trust and most people go immediately to this idea of personal trust or benevolence-based trust. And that's trust that, you know, I have your interests in mind, right? But there's really two other forms that matter a great deal too. One is competence-based trust, trust that you have the ability to do what you're saying you can do for me, that you can influence what I'm up to. 
and the other is dependability or integrity based trust. Do you kind of uh, can I count on you to come through, right, on on what you're saying, right? Are you do you do you kind of walk the walk, uh, if you will? And so what we're seeing in this when we say um, uh, mistrust in your network is, again, not that you don't trust people, but the, the people you're working with are shifting so rapidly today because of these agile contexts that I may not have a really clear sense of, you know, Kevin's true capabilities, right? No, he's a great person, right? A good worker, everything else, but not really how and when he's going to show up. Uh, and so I'm always checking to see, you know, what exactly am I going to get? How am I going to get it? You know, how, what do I need to complement? Whereas if we've worked together for 20 years, you don't have that, right? You're in a secondhand language and you're you're just more efficient right in the in the exchanges that you're making there so a lot of that and especially the companies that i'm talking to on this issue too if you look at for example competence-based trust um, we know that what people often don't do well is give others the information they need to trust in their capabilities quickly right we sit in a room and we know we can do this thing so we say I can do this thing. And the other person may go, well, I don't know about Rob, right? <laughs> he just got here. You know, can he do it? Can he not? They wouldn't say that, but it'd be in the back of their minds and they may just not go in the direction you want. Whereas the people in our, our worlds that were really quick at building competence-based trust, one of the whole set of behaviors they would do is they would say, you know, here's something we've done before that worked really well. How could it apply here? Right. And so then you're looking at this thing and you're saying, well, not do I trust Rob, but wow, he's already done this. And what's the relevance? How does it apply here? And you would find that you overcome that hurdle of trust, right? You're able to kind of build trust a little bit more rapidly through a whole set of kind of subtle, subtle interactions there. So, so that's that's a high level, you know, of the kinds of things that are embedded in that one. You know, the um... Tom's... oh, go ahead, Karen. No, I was just gonna say Tom's comment on the chats that just popped up, I thought was really good. It is just the reality of how we work these days. And um, you know, we don't have that ability to know what everyone can do. And so thinking about trust on the different levels that, that Rob just said, I think is really important because it's if you only are defining it in your head as who would I want in a foxhole with me, um, you're missing the opportunity to build trust with people that you are working with, who, who you, whose performance is going to affect your performance. That's the key. And so building mm -hmm. trust, finding ways to build these other forms of trust, I think are actually only going to benefit you in the long run. So Sorry, the, Kevin, go for it. No, that's okay. The, I was just going to say the subtitle to your book is is in two parts, really. It says how little things pile up and create big problems. And then the second part is in what to do about it. So let's get into that second part of what to do about it a little bit more. Um, and I'll just turn it over to you guys to walk us through this. Yeah, yeah. Well, so this is um, what we know first is the more that you can take that grid that we just talked about, the first half of the book kind of walks through what these micro stresses are and different strategies for different ones there. Um, <clears throat> but then the second half is really looking at what we call our 10 percenters, right? They were the people where we had to you kind of be in these interviews with us, right? The first 10 minutes of every single one, it was rainbows and lollipops. Everybody was doing great, right? These are successful people. That's their narrative in life. And, and then you get down to minute 30, minute 45, and the, the cracks would start to come in. And we literally had people choke up by kind of 75 minutes in, in different ways, just with the different pressures, feeling they weren't able to kind of execute on all fronts. But then we had about 10% that never went there, right? They, they stayed high and positive really throughout. And that was the group we really got interested in for the second half of the book to see, well, what are you doing that's enabling you to kind of thrive differently? Right, than the rest of us still producing, still crushing the work side of it. All these people were super high performers, well regarded organizations. And one of the things we looked at was how are they more resilient? Right. And so we're taught that, generally speaking, that resilience is something that we own. Right. That's a, a really how a lot of the approaches take it as a, as a human capital versus social capital phenomenon. And so it's we own this, we have grit, we have fortitude, we're leaning in, you know, all the books that you can think of there. Where we got interested in as well is how does our network help create resilience? You know, the connections that we have around us. And if you take that lens and you ask, you know, 300 people in, in the case of this book um, to tell you about a time in their lives where they got through a setback and the setbacks would be ranging from I didn't get the promotion up to my spouse died from pancreatic cancer. You know, they took a huge range of, of things. But then you focus not on what did you do, but how did you fall back on others, right? What was it that you got from others that enabled you to get through the situation? And you see what a, a title that Karen wrote for one of our pieces, you see resilience as a team sport more than we realize. 
um, that the degree to which we uh, have others in our lives that can provide seven to eight things uh, and these benefits we've listed down the side here, uh, we tend to do a, a lot better. Right. And so it's not just empathy. In fact, if you overdo on empathy, you start to spiral in, in potentially negative ways. It's people that give a perspective in the situation, people that help you see a path forward if they've been through that situation. Uh, for me, it's laughing at the absurdity of the situation. If I just have a couple people. I can laugh at things and I reset in, in different ways. And so what we could see in this work is the people that had those relationships and really importantly knew how to use them. Right. For me, it's not so much empathy. I just want to laugh. I want to see a path forward. Right. That's my my process through it. For others, it's very different. Right. To to kind of get through uh, difficult setbacks. And so with this table, you know what we're what we're suggesting is part of the problem with all the books that have recently come out saying that we need quality connections back in our lives is it leaves you with this conundrum of I've got to go get two new best friends. Right. And that's really hard to do. It takes a lot of time. You don't have the time. You don't know if they want to put the time in you. It's just a lot of problems with that strategy. So what we can see in here is the people that were, were actually more resilient. It wasn't their best friends that were doing it for them all the time. Right. And this grid is really designed to say, OK, where do you have needs that are important to you? And then start to think about, OK, that core circle around you. Are there people that you want to tap into more or less? You may actually want to lean on your spouse less because sometimes that creates greater spin in your world. Sometimes it's great, but sometimes it creates greater spin because they don't know the whole context and they're just supporting you in the situation. And you may end up more frustrated, for example. Um, but then you should also be looking two layers out, right, to that group of people in the 12 to 15 person range. This is the group that we would have over for dinner every now and then, and just start initiating certain kinds of interactions that, that start to create perspective and dimensionality in their lives. And that's helpful. That's a form of resilience. We don't think about it that way a lot, but that's a form of resilience because it starts to put things in, in different perspectives. And then look even further out, and think about, well, what are the connections in this 50 to 150 ring around us? So the 50 ring would be people that you would legitimately invite over for a barbecue. The 150 would be people you'd invite to a wedding, right, in general, to put, put frames on that. And say, how could I initiate, you know, some of these people back in to my life? And, and uh, Karen, if I can hand it to you in a second to tell, you know, our story of our, our eight-minute calls, that would be great. But I'll give you one example from the research is we had a, a very successful neurosurgeon that uh, you know was one of the interviews and stayed in contact with me. And probably two or three months after the interview and another discussion we had, he wrote me a note and he said, Rob, I'm playing guitar and loving it. You know, he said, my life had evolved to just my clinical and, and, um, and research-based role in my direct family. And coming out of it, I realized I'd left passions that I had in the past. And so I reached back to a passion I had around playing guitar. He'd been in a band in high school, you know, decades ago. He went into a, a, a music store, picked up a guitar, walked out. And as he walked out, he passed by a flyer that was a group looking for a guitar player. And they said something like, what we lack in quality, we make up for in volume, like a spinal tap kind of thing. And, and he called him up. And, and he, when he called me, he said, you know, I'm playing with 20 year olds. And he said, it's the best thing I've ever done, right? I, I removed myself from work. I'm hanging out with people that care about very different things. And that is a form of resilience for him, right? Importantly, it's not his best friends, right? It's not one or two best friends, right? It's actually looking for and finding it and thinking about what's the uh, the interaction uh, that, that creates it that a lot of people can go do. I don't care, you should tell, tell about our eight minute phone calls because people may get a kick out of that. <laughs> So Rob and I both have been trying to practice what we wrote about in the book, what we learned from the temper centers. And one of the one of the things that they're good at is not necessarily going out and making a whole bunch of new best friends, as Rob just talked about. You know, it's an overwhelming thing to think about. If the advice is go make more friends, that can be overwhelming. One of the things they do well is sort of reach back to, to dormant ties and reconnect in some ways. And so Rob and I have both been doing an experiment that's actually been really fun and checks a lot of the boxes on the left where we've been um, asking people who we've sort of lost a bit of touch with, but people that we are friendly with would probably be somewhere in that um, you know, 50 to 150 for me, and asking them if they'd be willing to do an eight minute phone call to catch up. And everybody laughs, eight minutes, not 810, not 902. <laughs> Eight minutes, the idea being that all of us can spare eight minutes. And I actually set my phone timer and I say in advance, I'm going to keep us honest with this. We're going to keep it on eight minutes, which takes the burden down. I do it on phone, not on Zoom, because you don't even have to feel like you look good. And it's been really wonderful. I think I've had about 30 phone calls with people I haven't been in touch with for a while that has checked off some of those great boxes. And now some of them were staying in touch by text. It's just added. It's added to my life and my resilience network. 
Uh, Rob's done a similar thing and it's been really fun. I think almost nobody that we asked didn't say yes. And all of my calls, I think Rob's the same, it's been true for you, have been really fun or wonderful or we, the people that I used to laugh with, I still laugh with, or we're catching up on some career thing. It's been really wonderful. And eight minutes, you can spare eight minutes to do this. <laughs> That's great. Well, I was hoping you guys were going to address uh, this one down here that says helps you make sense of politics, because that's one I, I definitely need some help with uh, personally. Mm. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I, I think I think, uh, you know, as we approach the next presidential election, you'll see a lot more checks in that box. <laughs> but um, let's um, let's move on to the you mentioned, Karen, the 10 percenters. And I know you guys have a slide, uh, the next one on on uh, 10 percenters. Um, and how they're living above some of these micro stresses. Uh, let me just do it at a high level and then Rob might wanna walk through the sort of particulars on the slide. But one of the things that we learned from the 10 percenters that's really valuable, and the eight minutes is a great example of it, is they find ways to connect with other people. We call them connect, uh, authentic connections to build what we call a multi-dimensional life. So their work is not, as for many of us is, focused, their life is not entirely focused on work and family, but they still have other parts of their life that they care about. The key point being in small moments. They don't, they don't necessarily think they can only find purpose and meaning by hiking um, the Himalayas or raising a million dollars for charity, but they can find ways in all of these ways that Rob can talk through to just connect with people in a way that adds purpose and meaning and adds to their resilience network and actually helps improve their physical well-being by making an effort to do that in ways that are not overwhelming to do. They, they're in, they bake them into their everyday life in some way. And Rob, maybe walk through what you have here sure. on the slide. Yeah, this is just another tool for people to hold on to because what we're, you know, we're if you track with us a little bit where we're going is oftentimes the focus is on the relationships and I need two best friends. And the reality is what we see really matters is the interactions in the relationships. And if you start taking that lens about what kind of interactions do I need to be getting, it, it opens up a sea of opportunities for us to take more control of our lives. And the reality is we've never had more ability to shape what we do and who we do it with, but we give it away too quickly um, today. You know, we fall into other people's expectations of fun. So this was, you know, the idea of looking at, at what are the interactions in our lives that create a sense of purpose. And what we know, right, you know, most people out there, they think of purpose as coming from either the mission and, and, and kind of vision statement of the organization or the work itself. And that's very true. But if you really go to a bunch of organizations, you find some that are doing really mundane work that have truly purpose-fueled cultures, right? And so what we focused on was what are the interactions that create a sense of purpose for you? And the, the lighter purplish color on the right were interactions that you know created purpose at work, right? Professionally. So you may buy into the culture, you may love co-creating the future with your peers, you may really like being a mentor or part of a team, or maybe the client base, right? Whoever consumes your output that you love the interactions with. Uh, and the, the lighter blues on the left here were really the, the personal forms of it, right? And so it could be spiritual isn't a great word. I should call it aesthetic, but it you know, could be from interactions with around poetry, religion, art, uh, relig um, uh, music, you know, other things like that, more aesthetic parts of life, volunteering. We know in, in terms of well-being anyways, giving is always better than getting friends, community, and family. And, and it really especially importantly, extended family tended to be more associated with happier people. Um, and so to Karen's point, the really big deal for us is we were finding over and over again, it was the small moments that if people lived more authentically with others, that was the differentiator, right, for what created happier people. Uh, an example of this was uh, Silicon Valley executive, super, you know, type A, hard charger, Stanford, you know, graduate, um, probably speaking with her mid-40s, roughly, as we went through the interview. And she was saying to us, you know, I was a runner all my life. Right? That's how I got identity. Came out of Stanford. I think she did cross country there. And then she began running, you know, in 10Ks and marathons. And she said, if I didn't get a personal best, and a 10K or a marathon, it was a bad year for running, right? And it was, that's a losing proposition as we, as we get older. Um, but, but what she said is one day she woke up and she said that was society's definition of what fun was and what, what good looked like in running that she'd fallen into. And what she really wanted to do was be running with her child, her child's best friend, and, and that child's parent, right? And so they started, you know, running together in the mornings and actually evolved into a full group in the community that uh, created, she said, the, the best, you know, uh, experience of running that she'd ever had, despite all her accolades, 
and all our successes with it. Um, and what she was doing, and for everybody on the call, this is really important to me, is she's taking the same activity she was already doing, right, running, and she's not running as fast but she's pivoting it in a way that's pulling her into two spheres that created a sense of purpose in her life for her, right? Community and, and family. And again, if you start looking at things that way, right? You start looking at how am I running my projects at work? How do I start things off? Am I, am I just focused on what I have to get done or do I back away for a second and say, what would pull me into more meaningful interactions? How am I handling my kids at home? Right? Am I just trying to get through the checklist or am I doing things in a way that could pull me into more of these spheres? Again, there's a, a, there's a sea of opportunity right, to pivot what we're doing slightly uh, and have pretty big impact on that. So, so again, just a, a tool and a framework for people to think about, but this was one of the hallmarks of that 10% group is that they were more intentional and purposeful in the small moments. And this is just, just one way of, of doing that. I just want to add one thing to that because it's really stuck with me that one of our 10 percenters who's exceptionally good at this and very, very successful, a very top performer, but has done a really good job of living in the small moment said that he works really hard at respectful no's so that he has time for, time for enthusiastic, spontaneous yeses. And so for him, having a neighbor come and knock on the door and say, can you help with my flooded basement and having the time to do it was a great success for his week that he had been able to be part of that community in a way. And I just think that's a really good thing to keep in mind, the respectful knows working hard at it so that you do have time for a spontaneous yeses i, di I didn't think you were going to call me out karen i thought that was all yeah i definitely like that that last point karen about the, the the power to say no so that makes makes room for for the yeses that are will be even more important to you um we've got about uh eight, 10 minutes left. Um, I actually had a question that I wanted to ask. Um, you, you've talked about, you know, the different types of friendships, the different types of relationships. I think I've heard you use uh, the, the word maintaining dimensionality uh, and making sure that you've got multi-dimensional uh, relationships in your life. Um, that in and of itself isn't new. In fact, uh, I my degrees in philosophy, I studied ancient Greeks, Aristotle, famously had a text called On Friendship, where he, he described friendship and the different types of friendships we have and why it's important to have those different communities in our lives. Um, but he didn't go nearly as far as you all are going here in talking about the impacts of not having that and, and the value of having it. Um, one of the things I think you stress in your book is that it's not just about having those authentic multi-dimensional relationships, but it's more about how you manage the interactions with each of the individuals, with all these all these different folks, um, and the power that that brings. So, Rob or Karen, can you say more about that level of it? Again, going far beyond what what Aristotle said twenty mm -hmm. five hundred years ago, but more the the managing of the interactions and and why that's so important. So you're asking me to extend on Aristotle. Is yeah, that... well, hey, it's... <laughs> well, because he didn't get it right. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> Thanks, Absolutely. <Tom. laughs> so, I mean, I'll tell you pragmatically, you know, what, what we're seeing. And there's three ideas, three things that come to mind. Just kidding with you. One is uh, it's really important. It's subtle what Karen said early. Um, but it's really important is that I think part of the reason, you know, Kevin, you mentioned burnout all time high before the pandemic, higher now. A lot of it is the stress that's coming at us through connection at a greater velocity than we've experienced before. It's those 60 minute meetings to 30 minute meetings. We see all the evidence of this, right? That the collaborative footprint of work is driving the stress higher. But what Karen also mentioned is we backed out of those groups that kept us whole to begin with, right? And so when I talk about, for example, my marathon runner and that dimensionality that created for her, it's the fact that you're spending time around an activity with a greater diversity of people than just friends. Right. She's not just spending time with their life science executive people. She's spending time with a male person, neurosurgeon. Right. And they have different views on life. Right. And they see problems differently. They see you differently. And that creates uh, dimensionality the way we talk about it, you know, in here. And if I look at it that way, we pulled out of that. Right. So so right now, you know, the, the burnout in, in our lens, the way we're looking at it is higher because the stress is higher. But our coping mechanisms have drifted right in pretty significant ways. Um, and so when we looked at how people did that, you know, Tom, more specifically, there tended to be three kinds of dimensions that I would see a lot of for the more successful people. 
one that had to do with health. And it, it could be, you know, for example, a tennis group, a cycling group, a running group, a walking group. Um, but just as often, it was also people that just decided they were going to eat more healthy, right? And they would, they would make meals together. They would focus on vegan lifestyles, things like that, right? So the health could take a lot of different forms, but the key was they were putting that activity in a set of relationships and that tended to persist, you know, over time. Number two, there tended to be one that was a little bit more aesthetic, right? In, in life. And that could be music, religion, art, poetry, just something that was a little bit, you know, different on that front that would pull people in. And then one that was more social, right? Just that group that you can kind of get the laughter from. So if I were kind of advising people, and as I think about this in my own life, right? Those are the three that I'm kind of working across. And I look for more dimensions than, than that overall, just with the space that I, uh, I have at this point. But those would be a couple of things I think that really matter there. And, and if, you know, one way that a lot of times it became clear to me, let me say it that way. Most people on this call have had moments in your life where you've been going along grumbling at all the crazy stuff you have to deal with. You're irritated with your kids, your boss, your best friends putting stuff on you you don't want to deal with. And you're just muttering about all the insanity of life. And then something truly traumatic happens like, bam, you know, you've got a health scare. You know, somebody dies that you, you love dearly. Your child is in trouble. And you look back on all these things that you're groping, griping about like crazy and that we're consuming your world. And you're like, why does that matter? Right. And I, I did a session at a major company two days ago, 400 people in the room. And I said, anybody had that? You know, 398 hands went out probably. And, uh, and so we kind of all get it, right? And what, what's interesting to us is the people with this greater dimensionality in their lives, they kind of live that way without the trauma, right? They kind of live above it because of that. And I think that's a really critical strategy because we can shape the first half of this book and say, here's how you combat micro stresses. But the reality is there's such a volume of them today that if you're not doing things that rise above them, you know, you're going to you're going to drown. Them. There's no end in sight for this that, that we can see anyway. So so that's what I would say to my friend Aristotle. <laughs> <laughs> I think Tom was actually saying you're smarter than Aristotle. <laughs> <laughs> I do pay him a lot. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's absolutely right. You're, you're going far beyond what he did. <laughs> um, Karen, uh, Marion asked in the chat that she missed the idea of the eight minute uh, conversations. Could you just recap through that really briefly? Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Okay, sorry. Uh, we didn't create it, so I need to uh, credit the source of it, but we both thought it was a great idea. It, it, you, if you Google the New York Times and eight minute phone calls or something like that, you'll see it. It came out of um, a book called The Good Life or a work, a series that the New York Times ran after the Harvard um, Wellbeing Project, uh, which has tracked the well being of people for I don't know, 80 years or 100 years. And that was one of their suggestions, too, is to try to find ways to connect with people in small moments. So you'll find it. So um, it, the idea is just that everybody can make time for eight minute phone calls. And if you do that, you can reconnect with people that you've lost a little bit of touch with perhaps during the pandemic in a really nice and, and easy way. Perfect. So Tom's brought up the uh, last slide here on your takeaway. So I'll just turn it over to, to both of you to walk through the five takeaways. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to start, Karen? Or you want yeah, to... sure. Yeah, go for yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, uh, you know, for us, we, a lot of this is just kind of, you know, summary conclusions. One is, Point we made earlier is just think about adapting the negative interactions. Again, negative doesn't mean necessarily purely toxic, right? Or those sorts of people. It can also be people you you love that are putting or spraying stress on you, as, as Karen coined that term that I love, uh, in different ways and shaping the interactions. The uh, negatives have three to five times the impact of the positives, right? And so if our tendency is just to reach to a positive or just to try to persist with meditation, um, that it just leaves stuff on the table, right? Those are all positive things to do. But but you're leaving stuff on the table. Um, uh, dimensionality we've we kind of just talked about, and I went into depth on that, you know, in very specific ways. Um, the one thing I would say with the dormant ties, what the research is showing is that that the, the newer relationships that we bring into our lives, the way we rejuvenate ties, uh, tends to have a very positive impact on our on our happiness. Um, being present and proactive with the people you, you care most about. So if you remember that resilience grid, we had the, the five, 15, 50 to 150, spending more time in the inner five, but making sure that you're present uh, is a big deal. Um, and then refreshing, you know, the relationships of the seven, eight minute calls, other, other things like that. The last thing I'll, I'll say that surprised me, and this is work coming from other research that's been done a lot, uh, you know, done a lot on this, is 
that it's the new relationships that are more predictive of our happiness necessarily than the old. And that kind of is a little bit counterintuitive, but the people that are bringing in new people into their lives, um, statistically, they tend to be uh, happier overall. So, you know, what that means is maybe lean into small moments with others, right, in, in ways, ask that second or third question, all right, rather than racing on to the next thing, things that might open up a relationship, open up a possibility. Um, you know, Karen's already said this, but, but it, what we would see over and over again is the happier people, they just tended to lean into the moment a little bit and amazing things happen. Right, they kind of spiraled in uh, in different directions. So those would be a couple of thoughts, a couple of couple of quick takeaways here. And I know you have a new app that just came out uh, with the launch of the book uh, as well. Maybe just talk about that for a second, Rob. Yeah, absolutely. So it is on the store right now, and it's called the Micro Stress Effect app. Um, and what it does is it allows you to go through these 14 micro stresses that we're talking about here and isolate out uh, three to five right, that have impact on you and actually uh, very quickly generate a report for yourself. But we have a wonderful colleague, Greg Pryor, and uh, others that have been really you know focused on building this app out. And it actually will deliver prompts to you. So you get reminders once a week around here's something you want to be paying attention to. Uh, in the next version of this, we're working on it right now, to actually create it as a team-based tool, right? And so that would then um, bring it into teams and not only deliver content to people, but spur a four-part conversation with teammates. I, I'm really bullish on opportunities to use that and to get it into research. So if people uh, on the call have opportunities that they're thinking about, I'd love to for people to reach out to me. I, I think that's where we really would start to change culture in some ways is by changing the dialogue in 100 teams, you know what I mean, throughout, a, throughout an organization. So yeah, that's it. Well, we're just about out of time. I, I just want to, on behalf of I4CP, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Karen, for sharing. Uh, what you've put into this awesome book. And I'm hoping that <clears throat> many of the people on the line can uh, can get the book. Uh, I know all of us in I4CP uh, already have it. I've also downloaded the app, so I'm looking to, you know, forward to uh, using that going forward. But just really appreciate all the great information that the two of you shared. Thank you. And for all thank you, you all here to support this work on so many levels, thank you. Yeah, so I'll just close things out. Um, I'll extend my gratitude and thank you both, Karen. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'll note too, for those of you like myself that like audiobooks, I believe uh, the Audible version is also uh, already available. Uh, if not, it will be soon, but I think I, I saw that it already it is. is. Yeah, it's along available. along with the, the written version, Kindle and, and so on. So uh, go out to Amazon or your preferred location and, and pick up the micro stress, micro stress effect and you'll get a lot more details than what we were able to walk through today. So thanks everyone for being with us on this latest Next Practices Weekly Call. We'll see you again next week when we'll have another guest and another great topic. Until then, have a great rest of your week and have a nice weekend as well. Thanks again, Rob and Karen. Thank you all. Karen. Have a great day.